Hello, and welcome to your Neural Networks and Optimization Lecture number three. It kind of feels like in our previous lecture, all we talked about were gradients. Gradients allow us to know what nudges or changes we should make to the different parameters in our model in order to optimize or minimize our loss function. And honestly, today is going to be more of the same. All we want in life when training something like a neural network is to know the gradient. Remember, gradients tell us for each parameter how changing that parameter is going to affect our loss function. And when we talked about this in our optimizers lecture, we basically just assumed that we knew what the gradient was, or we used a very simple function like a linear regression where the gradient is really easy to find. But in the types of neural networks that we're going to learn from this point on, the gradient isn't going to be that easy to calculate. In fact, we need an additional algorithm to calculate what those gradients are. One of the most common algorithms is called backpropagation. And backpropagation is just a method for computing the gradients of our loss function with respect to all the different parameters in our networks. Backpropagation is based on the chain rule, which you may have learned in calculus. Essentially, the chain rule says that if we have a composite function, so a function of a function, and we want to know how changing an input affects that composite function, we can basically use the chain rule to multiply various derivatives in order to get our answer. So for instance, I have this composite function f of g of x, which is the cosine of x squared. It's a composite function because it's made up of two different functions. It's made up of a combination of cosine of x and of the function x squared. So if I wanted to know how does changing x change the output of f of g of x, aka the cosine of x squared, I need to think about two things. First, I need to think about how changing x changes the function x squared. As I increase x, what happens to x squared? However, that's not the only part of the function. I also need to think about, once I have x squared, how does that affect cosine of x squared? The chain rule says in order to calculate that derivative, the derivative of our composite function, f of g of x, with respect to the original input x, all I need to do is multiply two derivatives together. First, I need to look at how does changing our original input x change our function x squared? Then I need to look at how does changing x squared change cosine of x squared? When I multiply these two derivatives together, I get the full derivative, which tells me how does changing x change the composite function cosine of x squared. And while this is a super simple example, we can actually chain together multiple functions with the chain rule. We can just keep chaining on and on. So how does this relate to gradients and backpropagation? Well, backpropagation is basically the application of the chain rule to neural network parameters. Let's look at this world's simplest neural network where all we have is three nodes with two weights and two biases. This input node x is just going to be the data that's coming into our model. In order to get this intermediate value h, we take x, multiply it by our weight 1, and then add a bias 1, which we don't usually show graphically, but you can see is added here. Then in order to get from h to g, we're going to multiply h by weight 2 and add bias 2 to get our final output g. So for our network, once we've produced a predicted value, we need to see how good that value is, how close is it to the value that we would like it to be. In order to calculate that, we need a loss function. I'm going to use the mean squared error because it's a pretty simple, pretty easy to calculate loss function. So remember that the mean squared error is just the difference between the actual value and our model's output, the predicted value, squared and then taking the average of all of those. If we look at how through this very simple neural network we actually get our output value g, you can see that we get it by taking our input value x, multiplying it by weight 1, which is right here, and adding bias 1. That gives us the intermediate value h, but then we take h and we multiply it by weight 2 and add bias 2. And that finally gives us 
our output value g. When we plug in the way that the neural network makes that prediction into our loss function, we get this. You can see that all we've done is replace this g sub i with the way we actually calculate the prediction. So now we have this beautiful loss function, and there's a ton of different values in this loss function that are changing what the value of the loss function are. But if you think about it, we don't actually have control over what our training data is. In other words, we don't get to set the inputs and the outputs of our models, which are these x's for the inputs and these y's for the outputs. Since we don't have any control over them, we don't really care about them. All we have control over in a neural network are our parameters, in this case, just our weights and our biases. So because we actually can change these weights and biases, we might want to ask the question, well, how should I change them in order to minimize my loss function? For example, what changes should I make to weight 1 to minimize my loss? What about changes to weight 2, or bias 1, or bias 2? Well, that's exactly what a gradient tells you. A gradient tells you what adjustments or changes you should make to all the different parameters in your model in order to minimize your loss function. But how do we calculate those gradients when the functions used to predict our values are getting more and more complicated the bigger our neural networks get? Well, the answer is, of course, backpropagation. So let's do an example. Using the loss function that we calculated previously, let's look at how changes to the weight 1 impact the loss of our model. Well, based on how the network is structured, we know that changing weight 1 will change what h is, that intermediate value in the middle of our network. And changing h will affect what g is. And changing g is will affect what our overall loss is. So we need to consider all of those things when we talk about how changing the first weight affects the loss of our function. So we're going to use the chain rule. Here, we're trying to find how is our loss affected when we make small changes to weight 1. First, we need to think about how does changing g, that predicted value, change our loss function? Then we need to think about how does changing h affect g? And finally, we need to think about how does changing weight 1, the parameter we're interested in, change h. When we multiply these three derivatives, we get our answer, how changing weight 1 will affect the loss function generally. We can work through this one by hand just because it's not too complicated. So the first loss that we want to calculate is how changing g affects our loss. In other words, the derivative of the loss with respect to g. Well, in order to calculate our loss, we just have 1 over n, and then the sum of yi minus gi squared. So all we need to do is find the derivative of this. Now again, I don't expect you to calculate this by hand, but the answer is negative 2 times yi minus gi. Okay, one derivative down. Now we need to consider how is g affected when we change h? So in other words, the derivative of g with respect to h. Well, it turns out that one's a little simpler to calculate. To get g, we do w2 times h plus b2. So just our weight times h plus a bias. Well, the derivative of that with respect to h is just w2. For our last derivative, we need to see how changing weight 1 will affect h. In other words, the derivative of h with respect to weight 1. And this math is also similarly simple. In order to get h, we take our weight 1 times x plus bias 1. The derivative of this with respect to w1 is just x. So when we multiply all three parts together using the chain rule, we get the derivative of the loss with respect to the weight. In other words, this function tells us how changing weight 1 will change the loss function. Now, of course, we need to add this up for every single data point that we have. But basically, we just figured out what the partial derivative is. In other words, we figured out the first part of our gradient. How does changing the parameter w1 affect our loss function? Then we would need to repeat this process once for each of the parameters that we actually have control over. However, we've already done most of the work. 
If you look at this formula, which is asking how does the loss change when we tweak B1 or our first bias, you can see that these first two terms are actually things we've already calculated. The only thing that's new is this. How does changing B1 affect H? Well, in order to get H, we use this formula. And the derivative of this formula with respect to B1 is just one. So in other words, we get one the derivative of h with respect to b1, times two derivatives we calculated before, the derivative of g with respect to h, and the derivative of the loss function with respect to our prediction, g. And that's it. That's basically what backpropagation is, except we're going to be applying it on more complicated network. For example, look at this network, which is still pretty simple, but a little more complex than the one we just looked at. Let's say we want to look at the effect of this weight, which we can just call w1. We can calculate the effect of changing this weight on the loss function using backpropagation, just like we did before. However, because of the structure of this network, we need to think about the fact that tweaking w1 here actually impacts the loss function in multiple ways. For example, here, it affects the loss function through this top path. And here, it affects the loss function through this bottom path. So when we ask, how does tweaking weight 1 affect the loss function, we need to add up the effects it has through this first top path as well as this bottom path. Another way that things can get a little more complicated is with activation functions. Now it's not actually g of x that's going into our loss function by making our prediction. It's actually f of g which is basically saying apply an activation function to the output g. Now when we use backpropagation to calculate our gradient, we're going to have an extra term because we also need to consider how changing g affects the output of f of g. Basically, how does changing g affect the output of our activation function? So you can see that the ideas behind backpropagation are simple. However, as our networks grow, it gets a little more tedious to actually calculate all of the derivatives because we have to consider multiple pathways as well as deeper and deeper functions. For example, if we look at this still very shallow network and we wanted to know what was the effect of changing this weight, we'll call it W1, on the output and loss of our model, well, there's a lot of pathways that that affects. Changing W1 will change the output of this node, and this node then impacts all of these other nodes. And then all of those nodes go into our final prediction. So you can see that calculating the effect of tweaking weight 1 on the loss function is going to be a little bit more mathematically complicated just because we have to consider all of these different pathways through which changing weight 1 will actually affect the loss. Now before we finish, I want to introduce some vocabulary terms now that you know what backpropagation is. The first term that I want to talk about is a forward pass. A forward pass just refers to sending your data through the network and getting an output or a prediction from your model. The backward pass where backpropagation happens is basically doing that backpropagation and adjusting our weights accordingly based on the gradients that we calculate. An iteration contains one forward pass and one backward pass. Essentially, we send our data through the model, make a prediction, use those predictions and backpropagation to update our weights, and that is a single iteration. The last vocabulary term I want to cover is an epoch or an epoch. I guess it depends whether you're from the UK or the United States based on how you say it. An epoch is one iteration through all of the data. In essence, one epoch means that your network has seen every single data point in your training set. Remember when we talked about the fact that we often don't use all of our data in order to calculate the gradient in each step of our gradient descent or other optimizer. For instance, we might want to do mini batch gradient descent where we have, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 data points used to calculate the gradient. In that case, an epoch or an epic contains however many updates and steps it took for your model to work through all of the data. So say you had 100 training examples and you were using a batch size of 10. That would mean that your model is going to do 10 updates before it has seen all of the data in your training set. So that one epic or epoch is going to be all of those updates. 
If we were using all of our data at every single update, then an epoch or epic would just be one single run through of an iteration. As we finish up, I just want to remind you that the most important thing to us when training these networks is gradients. All we want from life is a good gradient, and backpropagation is just one way to calculate the gradients for our models, which can get a little bit complicated the deeper and more complex they are. Backpropagation uses the chain rule in order to calculate how changing different parameters in our model is going to affect the overall loss of our model. And while that idea is simple, we have to keep in mind that especially with complicated model structures, changing one parameter might actually have an impact in multiple different ways on our loss function, and we need to add all of those up when calculating the impact of changing that parameter. All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.